Here are five awesome D&D subclasses that you have never heard of. They were created by Wizards of the Coast and you can play them right now, but they only exist in isolated documents almost a decade old. If you're looking for something new or to throw something at your players that they will never see coming, here are the five best lost subclasses from D&D. Oath of Treachery Paladin. This subclass is just awesome. Like the Oathbreaker, it's a suggested option for paladins who break their initial oath. You don't have to be evil, but you're probably not going to be lawful good, you know? To start, BAM! Amazing spell list. I've seen grown men battle to the death for spell lists half as good as this one. Then you've got two amazing channel divinity options. Option one, conjure duplicate. Use an action, create an illusory copy of yourself for one minute or until you lose concentration. Your illusion can't attack, but you can cast spells from its space instead of yours, and when you and it are within five feet of a creature, you have advantage on all attacks against that target. Free advantage is awesome, especially on paladins, because you crit twice as often to double that juicy smite damage. Option two, Poison Strike. This one costs a bonus action as you conjure a magical poison and coat a weapon with it. The next time you hit an enemy with that weapon, they take additional damage equal to 2d10 plus your paladin level. But if you had advantage on that attack, they instead take 20 damage plus your paladin level. A paladin barbarian multi-class with reckless attack can use this to guarantee a minimum of 23 damage on any attack they want, and you'll see later, but this goes hard by the late game. Knock knock, seventh level's here, and it's ready to beat the crap out of your enemies with your enemies. Aura of Treachery gives you advantage on any attack against a creature as long as one of its own allies are within five feet of it. It's basically reverse pack tactics. But also, if a creature within five feet of you misses you with an attack, you can use your reaction to force them to attack a creature of your choice that is within five feet of them including one of their allies. You can only do this three times per short or long rest, and it only works on creatures that can't be charmed, but still, it's good. None of these are broken because they really rely on enemies being bunched together and being next to you to work, but when those conditions are met, you are terrifying. 15th level gets you Blackguard's Escape. After you're hit by an attack, you can use a reaction to teleport up to 60 feet and turn invisible. That invisibility lasts until the end of your next turn or until you attack or cast a spell. But because you're invisible when you attack, you will get the attack at advantage, which you can combo with your channel divinity to guarantee 35 additional damage on that strike. Level 20 is Super Saiyan mode for the Paladin as always. As an action, you can transform into an embodiment of deceit and gain these benefits. You are invisible, ergo all your attacks are going to be at advantage. If a creature damages you on its turn, it has to pass a wisdom save or you control its next action. Yes, this is just as crazy as it sounds. Finally, if you have advantage on an attack roll, which you will because you're invisible, you get a bonus to the damage equal to your paladin level. That is 20 bonus damage on every single attack. Paladin capstones are always fantastic, and this is the type of source level 20 characters have to be cooking with if they're going to keep up with the wizards and the sorcerers casting Wish. Treachery is up there in power with the stronger Paladin subclasses, but with some solid balance checks. It's flavorful as Mama's Chili, and makes for a beautiful villain if you are an evil GM. Undying Light Warlock. Here's a cool concept, your patron isn't actually an entity, it's the divine radiant magic of a holy plane. This is pretty much the good aligned warlock option. Your bonus spells are fine. Flaming Sphere is pretty cool as some consistent bonus action damage, and Fire Shield is a fun defensive option that gives you resistance to some damage and deals 2d8 damage back to any creature that hits you with a melee attack. If you stack that Fire Shield with the classic Warlock spell Armor of Agathis, you become a walking bomb, with 20 temporary hit points exploding for 20 plus 2d8 damage on any creature that hits you with a melee attack. Your first level feature makes you even tankier, giving you resistance to radiant damage and a bonus to the damage of all your radiant or fire spells equal to your charisma modifier. Once you hit level 3, this is going to go great with that flaming sphere for repeatable improvement 
impressive bonus action damage every turn. At 6th level, you get Searing Vengeance. When you would make a death saving throw, you instead spring back to your feet and regain half your total hit points. Then, all hostiles within 10 feet of you take 10 to 15 radiant damage and are blinded until the end of your turn. Just stack on all that magical armor, and when you die, simply explode and come right back. 10th level gives you and the rest of the party some temporary hit points whenever you finish a short or long rest. It's an okay defensive feature that might let you gaslight your fellow players into short resting more often. 14th level gives you healing light, aka when the paladin lets you copy their homework for lay on hands. You have a pool of 15 d6s. As a bonus action, you touch a creature and expend 1 to 5 d6s from your pool and the creature regains that many hit points. Bonus action healing is great, and honestly, with all the tanking this build can do, you'll often be just using this on yourself or to pick up a downed ally in combat. Warlock is my favorite class, Barbarian Warlock is my favorite meme multi-class, and this Warlock is amazing for that multi-class combo. I never thought I'd see a Warlock I loved as much as the Genie, but damn, this one is close. Hey fella, do you ever play with yourself? What? Hey, don't worry about it. Sometimes I do it with a partner, sometimes with a group, but sometimes it's a one-man job, you know what I'm saying? Uh... Sometimes you gotta play by yourself with this awesome TTRPG. Oh, it's a game! Domain of the Deathless King by Archmage Press. It's a system where you can play D&D &D without a DM. You can play with a group or take the adventure on alone. Oh, so the DM could take the night off and play through this with the lads. You'll be playing with boys all night long. Bad phrasing, but this is cool. It's like those classic choose your own adventure books. Depending on the actions that you take, you turn to a different page and continue the narrative. It's got all the info on gold, NPCs, enemy behavior. I could use this to test out interesting builds or cool characters that I don't have a game for yet. And by taking different pathways, it has replay value. And it comes with maps and art. And it's free. Free? Free sample, baby. Just click the link below. And you can grab the full thing on Kickstarter when it drops in a couple of days. Okay, I'm gonna go play with myself. Nice. Then I'm gonna go play this. Wait, what? Grab your free sample of Domain of the Deathless King today. Link below. Phoenix Sorcerer. Okay, let's keep the rebirth theme going with this fire chicken build. First level and bam, you are already an arsonist. You can use an action to ignite any flowerable object you touch. Also, you get a transformation option, Mantle of the Flame. As a bonus action, you become wreathed in fire for one minute and gain the following benefits. You shed bright light for 30 feet. Any creature that hits you with a melee attack or touches you takes fire damage equal to your charisma modifier. And whenever you roll fire damage, the roll gains a bonus equal to your charisma modifier. That last one is worth building around. From 3rd level you get Scorching Ray, then you make multiple attack rolls with a 2nd level spell and every single one of them is getting a boost equal to your Charisma modifier. You are cooking with gas. It's also just great on the Firebolt cantrip. Adding your Charisma modifier to a cantrip is awesome, just ask Warlocks. This feature also combos fantastically as a 1 level dip for a Paladin. Grab the cantrip green flame blade or just get a flame tongue longsword and go wild. Level 6 is another anti-death feature, Phoenix Spark. When you would fall to 0 hit points, you fall to 1 instead and every creature within 10 feet of you takes fire damage equal to your sorcerer level plus your charisma modifier. Sorcerers are squishy, so this is nice insurance. And talking about being squishy, level 14 gets you nourishing fire. Now, whenever you expend a spell slot to cast a fire damage spell, like, I don't know, Fireball, you gain temporary hit points equal to the spell's level, plus your charisma modifier. This is just free passive regeneration that rewards you for what you are going to be doing anyway. 
burning people alive. Finally, at level 18, your phoenix form is complete. Now, when you transform as a bonus action, you also get these benefits. You have a flying speed of 40 feet. You resist all damage, which is wacky and amazing for holding onto concentration checks. And if you use your phoenix spark feature to stop yourself dying, it deals an additional 20 fire damage to creatures within 10 feet of you. That means that when you're knocked to zero hit points, you instead fall for one and then explode dealing 43 fire damage to everything within 10 feet of you. Sorcerers have a bunch of subclasses that are all pretty good, and this is just another one. For a fire-themed sorcerer, it's everything you could ever want, and much better than the pyromancer sorcerer that came out in Plane Shift. It's also not too complicated. I could see this as a great option for newer players who want to try a full spellcaster. Theurgy Wizard. This subclass got so close to being printed, it was actually released in two separate Unearthed Arcana. We'll use the most recent 2017 version. Just like the Arcane Trickster gives Rogue a little sprinkle of wizard power, the Theurgy Wizard gives wizards a little sprinkle of cleric but in a really weird way. Basically, at second level, you get Divine Inspiration, letting you choose any cleric subclass you want. That subclass is going to impact your abilities across the entire game. To start, you can learn spells from your chosen cleric subclass's domain spell list. So if you chose the Life Cleric to base your wizard on, you could learn the spell Bless at second level and Spiritual Weapon at third level, both of which are amazing. Also at level two, you get Challenge Channel Arcana, a wizard version of Channel Divinity that you can use once per short rest. As a bonus action, you can speak a prayer and give the next spell you cast a plus two to its attack roll or saving throw DC. Adding plus two to an attack roll, it's fine. Adding plus two to the saving throw DC of one of your spells is freaking crazy. With Silvery Barb's backup, you can force through some incredibly powerful spells like Dominate Person, Banishment, or Hypnotic Pattern. Alternatively, you can use your channel arcana to replicate the channel divinity option of the cleric subclass that you chose. Then your sixth level Theurgy Wizard feature gives you access to the first level abilities of the cleric subclass that you chose. Again, this is going to vary a bunch depending on what cleric subclass you're basing yourself around, giving a ton of customization to this subclass. At 10th level in Wizard, you get access to the 6th level abilities of your chosen cleric subclass. At this point, you're basically multiclassing Wizard and Cleric while only taking levels in Wizard. But hold up, because your final 14th level Theurgy Wizard feature gives you access to your chosen cleric's 17th level ability. The reason they give is that your academic nature and understanding of magic lets you nab it a few levels before a cleric ordinarily would. Obviously, the stronger cleric domains like Peace and Twilight are naturally going to be the strongest options to choose as this wizard, but the freedom to explore abilities from any subclass is kind of awesome. You can even do some really weird stuff, like multiclassing the Theurgy wizard with cleric and choosing a different cleric subclass as a theurgy wizard to the cleric subclass that you are multiclassed as. That means you've basically got two different cleric subclasses rolling at the same time on the same character. This is nuts, it's totally pushing the boundaries on D&D design space, and honestly, I freaking love that. College of Satire Bard. We've talked about some pretty powerful subclasses, so I wanted to end on one that was just beautiful, pure flavor. College of Satire is the prankster bard with a few roguish features sprinkled in. At third level, you get proficiency with thieves tools and in the sleight of hand skill and another skill of your choice. Already, you are set up as a fantastic skill monkey, but you also get tumbling fool, and this feature is Filthy. As a bonus action, you can tumble and you gain the following benefits until the end of the turn. You simultaneously take the dash and disengage actions. You gain a climbing speed equal to your walking speed and any fall damage you take is halved. There is no limit on this ability. 
every turn, bonus action, you can ignore all attacks of opportunity and double your movement speed. You are zippier than a blade singer, which is amazing for keeping out of trouble. This feature also goes hard in a ton of multiclass. I can see Hexblade or Paladin Bards loving this, giving them a ton of battlefield maneuverability and a bunch of Bard spell slots to turn into smites. Your sixth level feature is a roleplay option, but with a twist. To start, you can cast the spell Detect Thoughts a number of times equal to your Charisma modifier without expending a spell slot. This is a good spell. It lets you read the surface level thoughts of creatures nearby, but you can use an action to probe deeper into a creature's mind. And if you do, they make a wisdom saving throw. On a fail, you just get free access to pretty much anything significant they're squirreling away in their brain. However, if they pass that wisdom saving throw, the spell just ends except the College of Satire Bard gets a specific buff. If you cast to detect thoughts with this sixth level feature, even if a creature succeeds on its wisdom saving throw, they still suffer an embarrassing social gaffe. The examples given in the actual class itself are that they let loose a thunderous burp or trip and fall or loudly pass gas. This is basically the I use prestidigitation to crap your pants meme built into a genuine subclass feature. It's an awesome roleplay feature and it really pushes you to probe the minds of creatures in social settings. Finally, at level 14, you get the Fool's Luck feature. Anytime you make an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can expend a use of your Bardic Inspiration, roll the dice, and add the result to your check. That's a plus D10 at this level, and a plus D12 from level 15 and onwards. That's big, and it's pretty much always going to turn a failure into a success. However, there is a downside to using this feature, because when you do, your GM records the results you had on that roll and can then apply it as a penalty to a later attack roll or check that you make. When they do this, you describe an embarrassing mistake or misfortune that happens as you take the penalized roll. It's easy to miss, so I'm just gonna remind you here, a GM can't penalize a saving throw. They can only penalize an attack roll or ability check with this feature, so it's never gonna be too bad. Look, this is really cool, definitely aiming for a lot of hilarious in-game shenanigans, but here's the thing. GMs are busy. They've got a lot to keep track of, and I can totally see a GM forgetting to penalize their bard's rolls. That sounds like it would be an upside, except you can't use this feature again until the GM penalizes at least one roll with it. So instead of that, I recommend this tiny homebrew tweak if you are gonna play this subclass. Anytime you use your fool's luck to boost a dice roll, the very next attack roll or ability check you make gets a penalty equal to the results on your Bardic Inspiration dice. It just happens automatically, and it's almost like karma. You have this incredible swing of good fortune letting you push through a crucial saving throw, and then immediately afterwards, you have a swing of bad luck to compensate. Look, obviously no bard is ever gonna compete in power with the Eloquence College subclass, but if you're just looking for something that's fun and flavorful, and you're not trying to hammer the game into submission, this is an amazing choice. Or, as a level 3 multi-class option, it's genuinely very powerful. Getting three skills and a bonus action dash and disengage every turn is actually pretty disgusting. Remember to check out the D&D Shorts Patreon for a ton more amazing subclasses and races to play as well. I also run D&D games there for Gold Dragon patrons and above. There are new races, subclasses, feats, and rule systems published every month to expand your games. It's always awesome, and it really supports the channel. You can find that linked below. Also remember to check out other videos on the channel, like and subscribe, and yeah, that's all I got. I'll see you next time.